understand that this is a numbers game. If you, if you decide to get into dropshipping, you must commit to finding your first winning product. Paul is a numbers guy. And one thing that makes this interview really different is how many numbers Paul ended up sharing throughout our discussion. What you've got to do is watch this interview until the end, because in this interview, you're going to find out exactly what gross profit margin you need to sell products and still make a profit. You're also going to find out there are six criteria to look for in high potential products. You're going to learn how many ad sets to put in each campaign, how much to budget for your first dropshipping store, and exactly what numbers in your Facebook ads will tell you whether or not you're onto a winning product. Make sure you have a place to write all this info down because it's going to come at you fast. Meet Paul. Hey, what's up? Paul's dropshipping journey began when he tried to grow a beard. Instead of growing a full-blown beard, Paul built a full-blown dropshipping brand that made $112,000 in one year. Since then, Paul has sold that business and gone on to start more profitable dropshipping businesses, and he's now a seven-figure dropshipping entrepreneur. In today's video, Paul is going to share his product recommendations for 2020, and you're going to want to watch this until the end. Paul not only shares great tips on what to sell, but he also tells you how to sell them and who to sell them to. Paul, let's get started. All right, let's do it. Paint me a picture of what life was like for you right before you started dropshipping. Were you in school? Were you working? Like, what was going on? Yeah, so I was just collecting debt as a freshman in uh, college and I just I was working server four years and I just did not see any future in this and I just questioned why I was in school. Hmm. I was taking a marketing class. First day I took that class, I dropped out immediately. Really? Because like the marketing teacher, she had never started a business yet she was trying to teach me how to start a business. And I'm not in school to just learn to take tests, to pass the test. I actually want to learn how to market. So I, I went on YouTube and I learned I could actually learn more on YouTube as opposed to in this college class. Dropped out, started job shipping, eventually quit school, eventually quit my job, and um, here we are. So that's like the condensed version of a lot of massive success. Yeah. Take me to that first drop shipping business that you started, or I don't know if it even was a drop shipping business at first, but mm -hmm. what was that first business idea? So the first business idea was a beard growth product, because uh, as an Eastern Asian man, a lot of us don't have any beards, so I just wanted to, you know, beat the stereotype, be that first, or be one of the very few Asian guys that have, like, massive beards. So I learned that there was a huge community of similar-minded people trying to grow beards all over the world. So I set out a mission to create a beard growth formulation, and, um, and that unfortunately failed after, like, three months of every single day, like, doing hours and hours of research, spending money on chemists, uh, formulating products, oh, wow. and doing a bunch of research. And um, yeah, that ultimately did fail. So what's interesting to me is this business started as a product you were trying to design and create yourself. Mm -hmm. And then at what point did you discover and decide to go with dropshipping? Um, so right when I realized that it wouldn't work, the beard growth formulation, I was like, I'm just not going to take this failure. Like I know so much about beards. I know so much about the community. Might as well kind of do something with this knowledge. And then I figured out the beard care industry is actually a huge, like, multi-million dollar industry. And I was like, you know, people are already buying this. Right. So you have, like, all this knowledge about yeah. a particular niche. And if you just let it all wither away, that'd be such a waste of time. Yeah. I just didn't want to take that L. And I, I knew people were already selling these beard care products. People were already buying them. So I might as well, you know, I searched on AliExpress, found actually a lot of good beard care products. And I was like, let me just casually list these on my store. And then, and then I got more serious with it. We copied um, other successful beard brands and then just went from there. And another thing I think that really stands out about your story is that you were successful enough with dropshipping that you created your own brand. So you actually mm -hmm. had your brand on the products, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of dropshippers are concerned that they can't sell anything unless it has their own brand on it. Mm -hmm. What would you, how would you respond to that? I would actually say that you should figure out if the product is selling and then decide to maybe invest more money into stock, having the logo on it. Okay. I'd say actually for beginners, it's really risky to just buy a bunch of inventory with your logo on it, assuming that it's going to sell. So I would take the reverse approach and this is what I did. I tested a bunch of different products, figured out one particular product was selling well, and then I decided, okay, I'm going to buy just a hundred units. It's not a very big risk. And then after that sold out about 500 and then about a thousand. So it was very gradual and, and very low risk. 
And now at this point, you have sold that business mm -hmm. and you've started new ones, yeah? Yeah. What else are you up to these days? So right now, I'm actually just working on a couple stores and mostly my VAs manage that. So in my free time, I'm actually doing mentorship. Mm -hmm. So it's like a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. I notice nobody's really doing this. Once people buy a course, they don't have that ongoing mentorship. So that's really where I came in. I, I basically am there in their pockets every single day. Okay, does this ad look good? Should I kill this ad set? Should I scale this ad set? Oh, PayPal just banned me. What should I do? How should I respond? Um, this product, is this worthy to test? Mm. Kind of any question that you want to ask, that's, that's the role I fulfill. Great. Well, I'm going to make you fulfill that role today because I've got a lot of questions about the products you recommended. Okay. Ready to answer them? Sounds good. Let's yeah. get started. Let's do it. Okay, Paul, we're looking at the first product you recommend, which mm. is a projection light ring. Now, this ring has over 3,000 orders, and I've seen it before. In fact, mm -hmm. I think we might have even talked about it before. So one thing that I want to ask you right out of the gate mm -hmm. is, is this product saturated? In order to figure that out, we'd have to use Facebook video search. So just search up the product name and then look at the view counts and also the upload date. So whenever you look at the information, if it's within the month and it has a, like million plus views, that's pretty saturated. Okay. Uh, but if it's from like eight plus months ago, then, and it had that many views, and not recently that many views, then that's a kind of good sign that nobody's testing this right now, or not that many people are testing this. So it's a potential opportunity to try and sell that product. Uh, interesting, so you're, you're telling people not only look for the Facebook ads with a lot of views, but keep in mind that customers have short memories. Mm -hmm. And within eight months, they can forget that they saw this ad and they might be interested in it again. Mm -hmm. That's not something that we hear a lot on the show. That's a really good tip. Yeah, it's like you can recycle these winners. And mm -hmm. a lot of times I figured out these winning products, they're not fresh. They've been recycled year after year. So for example, like some summer products, they sell hot in June and then people forget about them. And then starting in May, somebody reintroduces it, the first person to reintroduce that product typically can just use an old video and make that a winner again. Why did you pick this as one of your winning products? What stood out about it to you that was positive? So I actually saw this product not only on Facebook, but I saw it on Reddit. And a lot of times I go on Reddit, you can see like extremely viral kind of product-based video gifts or something like that. So I saw a video of this on the highway or something, somebody was spinning it and it had like 100,000 upvotes. And the comments were like, oh, where can I get this? Oh, that's so cool. I know somebody would like this. So I just saved it and then I just immediately uh, imported it. Now, if you don't mind sharing just with our viewers, are there particular Reddit threads that you find a good source of ideas? So there's a couple. I can't remember the exact wording. We can help you with that and drop them in the, the description later. I think it's called Damn, I Want That. Okay. Or, um, shut up and take my money. <laughs> um, and, and I would just say those two in particular. Now I'm curious to know, okay, you found this product, you know people want it. Mm -hmm. I go here, I see it costs less than $2 and then shipping with ePacket is like three bucks. So it ends up being less than $5. Most drop shippers would say, multiply that by three. Mm -hmm. So we'd get like $14.99 possibly for a product. But if you're telling me everyone on Reddit wants this, then I'm tempted to say, let's price this high. Yeah, I mean, I'm honestly leaning towards high too. When you see a product like this, it's a ring. So rings automatically have that high perceived value. Mm. So if you price this thing at $15, People think that this is a $15 product, so it's not that special when you buy it for that special someone. But if they spend some money on this, then it increases their satisfaction that like, I invested in this product for that somebody because they're special. So for this product, I'd probably maybe even go up to 60. If that doesn't necessarily work, I'd do 39.99. And let's just say if that does not work, Last resort, I'd go $29.99, but never, nothing lower than that. I know a lot of drop shippers would get nervous because they mm. know how cheap this product is priced on AliExpress and they're mm. thinking, oh my gosh, if I price it for 60 or even 30, that's too high. Yeah. Do you have personal experience seeing that like you can price products high and still get sales? Yeah, so in my first ever um, drop shipping store, the Beard Store, I had a product that was selling for $16.99 and then at the end of the year, it was selling at $29.99, so a tremendous difference. So it has everything to do with perceived value. Mm. Like for example, that beard comb that I sold, it had a silver screw that was selling for $19.99. I asked my supplier to change that with a golden screw, like a copper screw, and then automatically perceived value goes like goes up the roof. 
$29.99. Just with that one little screw? Just with that one little screw, yeah. Incredible. It's, it's crazy, yeah. Interesting, really cool. Okay, I have some more questions about how you find and test winning products, but I would mm -hmm. say let's dive into that with the next product suggestion. Sure. Paul, this product mm -hmm. is a wall-mounted mop holder. Is that mm -hmm. how would you would characterize it? I would name it something like garage storage organizer, okay. something along the lines of that. Why? But, um, because if you just say mop holder, they think it's only for mops or something like that. You want to say like this is all inclusive, like utensil or have some sort of broad word that categorizes any kitchen, any garage, any, you know, product like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. How did you find this product on AliExpress? So that's interesting. I actually found this product through Amazon's bestsellers page. Did you? And I usually don't use that as a source, but I know some people do and it works out. Um, so I noticed that just like shot up the roof on the, the best sellers rank. And then I, saw, I was like, huh, can I find this on AliExpress? Found it and then, yeah, if it worked on Amazon, chances are it's probably gonna work on Facebook. Now, one thing that I'm curious about is um, we often tell drop shippers you should find a product with a wow factor. Mm -hmm. To me, this doesn't have a wow factor. It's not like light up unicorn slippers or something. Yeah. So how do you grab people's attention with a product like this? So this product, I would definitely lean towards a video. You okay. can't really just sell it with an image like that. So a video, for example, you would have something like, you know, a very messy garage with the rake, with the, like all these different things, they're just everywhere. And then all of a sudden you have them stacked, like a five second clip of somebody putting all their, you know, things on it. And then, um, so that would kind of trigger the wow factor. So with the wow factor, a lot of times the product innately has that wow factor just in the way it's designed or just mm -hmm. the functionality of it. But sometimes you can take a video and make an average product that doesn't necessarily seem like it's a wow factor and make it, make the video have that kind of wow factor effect. The wow here is not so much like the product, but the before and after that the product can kind of enable. Kind of like that, yeah. Okay. And also the value that it would provide for those very kind of handy men, uh, those people that are always at home, those that certain type of audience. On the subject of handy men or handy women, um, how would you find your target audience for this with a Facebook ad? So whenever I approach targeting on Facebook, the first thing is I don't really think too much about it. I just enter the product name. So this would be like organizer. Uh -huh. And then if that suggestion is there, I click on that and then hit suggestions. And then this process, it's really a brainstorm process. You're not thinking too much. You're just selecting everything that's relevant on the Facebook uh, suggestions. So maybe rake, maybe garage, maybe tools, whatever. And then you get, you get some inspiration from that. Mm. And then, okay, you say rake, oh, rake is also similar to this thing. And then, you know, you just kind of brainstorm throughout that process. I think you're the first drop shipper to suggest entering the product name or something like the product name as an interest. Mm -hmm. Usually people are putting in niches. I think I over-research it. I think I'm like, what clubs do they belong to? And then I try yeah. to guess, mm -hmm. but that's really practical. Like, it, you know, think about how broadly you could describe this product and mm -hmm. use that to start building interests with a Facebook audience. Exactly, yeah. Here's a question though that I know all of our new dropshippers are going to ask. Mm -hmm. After they create this video ad showing before and after, and then they target people who like rakes, organizers, and garages, mm -hmm. they launch the ad, maybe they're spending five, ten dollars a day on it. Mm -hmm. What numbers should they look at to determine if this ad is performing well? So the first thing when you just start an ad set you're not gonna get any ads cards or any purchases like in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. First thing you should look at is cost per click. Okay. Specifically the unique cost per link click. And that number will tell you a good indicator of what this product or what these ad sets are gonna look like when they spend $10, $20. So this cost per unique link, link click, I always kill it if it's above $2 or above $2.50. So if I spend like $5 an ad set, only get two clicks, immediately done. I'm not gonna spend any more on it. I hope you guys pause the video and write that down because that is really golden advice. It's very yeah. rare that dropshippers can give such good kind of concrete benchmarking numbers like that. So yeah, there's actually two more. So let's say if it does have a lot of link clicks and it's very cheap, like a dollar or something, then it, I wait until it spends $10. And if it doesn't even have any initiate checkouts or ads carts by that point, then I usually kill it. And then also let's say it does have a couple ads carts or initiate checkouts. 
$15 is the next barrier. If it doesn't have any purchase by $15, you can be a little lenient, maybe 15 to 18, something around there. Um, if it doesn't have any sales, I usually kill it too. I see what you're doing. Basically, the cost per unique click is telling you whether your ad is effective. And if it's cheap, that's like, that's great. People are clicking it. Exactly. And then you're looking at these, okay, people are clicking, but are they buying? And that's where the thresholds for total ad spend come in. Exactly. Really cool. With dropshipping, it's, it's really a numbers game. So we want to prioritize our budget on products that are getting a bunch of clicks, a bunch of purchases on day one, day two. Those are winning products. A winning product always looks like a winning product on day one and day two. Does Typically, it? Typically, yes. Uh, From my experience, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I am excited to ask you a lot more about budgets. And for that, let's move on to the next product. All right, let's do it. Paul, this product, these are called tactical work pants. Yep. It sounds like I've never seen these in stores before, but I think I kind of get it. They have lots of pockets for people mm -hmm. to stuff stuff into. Why are you choosing this as a winning product for dropshippers? So again, I, I'm not sure if I would necessarily test this product. It meets the criteria, but you should always do the research, competition, saturation, things like that. Mm. Or unless you want to take a spin on it and do a new video, a fresh new advertisement, a fresh new angle, then you can make saturated products. You, you could, like there is a such thing as a saturation, but you can also make saturated products work. So what I really like about this is that it already has a good video attached to it. And also the audience is huge. You could expand to multiple niches. So for example, you could do construction workers. That's like 50 million people. You could do uh, certain sports categories like fishers. You can do electricians, um, contractors. Like, and these niches are in the millions, like tens and like 20, 30 million. So, if one niche works, you can move on to the next niche, next niche, next niche. So it's virtually like infinitely scalable. And so for each of those niches, would you create a new or different ad that speaks to that niche? So at the first one you're testing, I typically just do one to two creatives okay. just because we don't know if this product's gonna sell. We don't wanna put too much work into this. Um, but once I figure out this product is selling very well, then I might you know do some extra work on the creatives, very, making a very tailored focus to whoever who I'm selling it to. Um, so yeah, I would do that. You're starting to talk about multiple creatives and stuff, and I can smell the fear of new drop shippers through the camera here, thinking, oh my gosh, multiple creatives means multiple ads, which means mm -hmm. multiple $10 a day ad campaigns, and they're just wondering, how much money do I need to get started with drop shipping? Okay, so to get started with drop shipping, people like to say the benchmark $500, and mostly I would agree with that, but with $500, it's very limiting. You can't really have any room to test products. You have to be extremely strict with, okay, I'm gonna test this product only and not these products, even though I like them. So $500 is very limiting. I'd say $1,000 is very, it's very comfortable. Thank you for giving a number because I've asked that to other dropshippers and I know it can be really difficult to land yeah. on a number. If you're thinking about starting a dropshipping store and you want more advice on how to budget for that store, click this link right here. And one more question about this before mm -hmm. we move on to the next product. Uh, pants require sizes. Yep. Is this a product that you would recommend for a new dropshipper or is it a little bit more advanced because you need size charts? Uh, so there's not really any level of difficulty for the products you're going to test. Okay. Um, but generally that is true. Clothing and jewelry, those and watches, those are kind of risky, kind of difficult. Not not difficult, but just hard to make sure that the quality is there mm. and then the sizing and stuff like that. But a product like this, we see that it has good reviews, and we see that the reviews have pictures of men putting the sh um, the pants on, and we can assume that the the sizing is somewhat relevant, somewhat accurate. Um, and then of course you should have all the size charts in your description and also Europe versus United States They have different metrics. They have different uh, conversion So you should do that for them, you know, like some people don't know what inches are Converted to like centimeters or something like that. So you should also provide that so it takes a little bit of extra work But it's totally possible to sell this product. Definitely. Awesome. Definitely. Let's move on to the next product to sell That's it. This product is a pet bed. It's called in fact like a pet igloo I love the pet niche. I know it's really a profitable niche, mm -hmm. but I know it's also getting more and more competitive. Mm -hmm. How do you stand out with a product like this? So a product like this, it already stands out. So you wouldn't necessarily stand out from your competitors. You would find that the product stands out and pick that product before the competitors, 
Or let's say if it was, it was already saturated, then you would kind of come up with a new creative, a new angle, new, new ways to make a saturated product work, essentially. But a product like this stands out because it's a very emotional product. Um, you know, consumers are really, they're willing to spend on their pets, not really because they need it, but because, you know, out of love, out of, you know, empathy, out of, it's a very emotional kind of purchase. So if you kind of present that to them and present them that emotional aspect, then they're going to rationalize and say, oh, it actually is getting kind of colder in our house. So first they're hooked in with the emotion, then they rationalize it mm -hmm. with logic and then they purchase. Okay, I, I kind of get that. Mm -hmm. What I'm wondering is if a dropshipper wants to sell this pet bed, what does their store look like? Is it a one product store with just this? Is it a niche store for, I don't know, other igloo stuff or other mm -hmm. pet beds? Or is it a general net? pet niche store? So it could honestly be either one, but if you're a beginner, I, I mean, this is very controversial. Everybody has their own insights and stuff, and I'm not saying they're wrong, but for me, I never recommend a one product store for beginners because it's very hard to look at a product and say that this is the product that's going to sell. This is the product that's going to work. I'm going to make a lot of money on this product. You can't really say that when you haven't tested it. So mm -hmm. if you do the whole thing of creating a store, you know, doing all this upfront work and you're not sure it's going to sell, it's very risky. Mm. But a product like this would sell very well on a general store, a niche store. Um, and if you did have one product store, it would work as well. Um, so yeah, just, it's very open. Okay. So it's not, would you say it's very important then for dropshippers to like choose a niche, for example, cat accessories versus general pet beds, or is it not that important? So if you want to have a more catered store, what I would actually recommend is a industry store. So this is actually something I termed. It's it's basically a hybrid between general and niche. So let's say uh, if we were in the pet industry, we would sell anything, any pet product like parrots, birds, dogs, cats, you know, hamsters, anything like that, as opposed to a very niche store, that'd just be dog store. So you can mm. only sell dog related stuff. So I would say if you do want to have a catered store, make it very broad, but have several niches inside of that store. That's like a lot of setup time though, right? You need to, you, you can't just create a general pet store with five products in it that would look weird. So you kind of need, like how many products should a new dropshipper stuff into that store before they start advertising it so the store looks legit? When people land on your link on Facebook, they're not analyzing your store. They're not oh. making sure, okay, they're not checking the boxes. Is this store legit? Is this store, does this store have a good collection? Does this store have a lot of different products? They just want to know that it looks good. The site looks good. Because if it looks good, then they're going to intuitively think, okay, this is somewhat trustworthy. Someone put actually effort into this. Uh, and the product photos, if those look good and stuff like that, everything looks good and clean, then they're going to trust your website essentially. I see. So most of the times people are just on the product page and then they might go to the home page but they're definitely not going to dig through your whole entire store. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to get some product page tips from you and I think I will get them with your next product suggestion. Okay. Paul, your next product is something that will set car seats on fire. <laughs> it looks like. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. Actually, like an image like that as a thumbnail, it just, you can't help but ignore it. So that's, that could also help with it. And it's actually heated car seats for mm -hmm. people who, uh, didn't, yeah. who didn't get my excellent sense of humor. I said that I wanted to ask you about product pages and mm -hmm. I'd love to do that with this. How might you broadly structure a product page for these uh, electric car seat heating covers? So I would approach this product, the product page, the way I would with every other product page. This product isn't necessarily special in, in terms of my, my process. So the process is I just, to choose the listing that has the best pictures. So as you will tell, like a product is duplicated like tens and 20 times on, on AliExpress, sold by different listings. So you wanna select the listing that has the best pictures essentially, and ideally the most reviews, the most sales. Um, and then choose that. The reason you do that is for marketability. The best pictures have the highest conversion rates. And then, you know, just do the process of writing a product description by searching your competitors, kind of replicating content that already exists and doing the reviews. Um, having a lot of images in your descriptions also help and then having your descriptions be very readable. So oftentimes I see my mentees, they have long paragraphs, they have no breaks. People are not going to read that mm. like at all. So you want to break those up with pictures. And a lot of times if you have futures in your, in your description, you can have a picture represent each future. Oh. So picture, future, picture, future, 
and it just it helps with reading the content, consuming the content. Yeah, a lot of people don't think of product pages as a place where you can format and use boldface and insert mm -hmm. pictures and stuff like that, and even videos. But definitely, yeah. The the text field in your product description space in Shopify is pretty rich. Like you can edit it. Now I want to ask you about legal liability. Oh snap. Paul, you recommend this stroller as a drop shipping item. Mm -hmm. And two things about this give me a little bit of hesitation. The first is the price. It's over a hundred dollars. Yep. So would you drop ship this for three hundred dollars? I wouldn't price it that high necessarily. I'd probably price this product at let's say the net cost cost maybe $130. I'd probably price this around 169, 189. Oh. Maybe even 199. Yeah. And why with free is, shipping. What sorry, why is the pricing different for uh, more expensive products? Because this really just comes down to the margin. So if you think about margins, uh, a, above a thirty dollar gross margin is is definitely very, very healthy. Twenty dollars is pretty standard, pretty pretty decent. Anything below fifteen dollars is very dangerous territory, mm. because like a couple of bad ad days will easily make you into unprofitability. So aim for at least twenty dollars. At least twenty dollars profit margin. Gross profit margin. Gross profit margin. Okay, this is interesting because I think a lot of dropshippers are looking at inexpensive products, like mm -hmm. five dollar products, and they're thinking, "Great, I'll sell this for fifteen, mm -hmm. but that only gives them a ten dollar gross profit margin, right? Exactly. Yeah. So you're saying, look at the products that cost a little bit more, so that you can price them a little higher and get at least a twenty dollar gross profit margin. Not necessarily. Not not look. Not find the products that are more expensive, but. Whatever the price range is, aim for $30, aim for $20. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Really, really helpful. That said, a big concern that I have with this stroller is that mm -hmm. it is something you put an infant in to protect the infant. And I get worried that dropshippers might expose themselves to liability mm -hmm. with a product like this. Yes, I do tend to stay away from products that have that kind of very high risk. But with a product like this, I see that it has. 92 reviews. I would collectively look at all the reviews, to see mm -hmm. if, you know, for this exact product, see collectively all the reviews, see if it's, you know, are there any concerns? If there is any review that says something like, something that's very concerning, then I probably would just move on to the next product. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would you find this product from multiple suppliers and look at those reviews too? Yeah. So I would try and find which one has the best reviews. Yeah. And then I would just look at the product in general, see if that product is being sold by different suppliers and what are everybody's general reviews looking like. Okay. One thing that does make this product appealing is it comes with a video ad. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend that dropshippers use the AliExpress video ads or do you think, listen, every other dropshipper is going to use this ad, go ahead and create your own? So to answer your question, I definitely would not say no to using the video. If it's a good video, definitely use it by all means. Cool. Now we're looking at an LED light strip. Now mm -hmm. earlier in the video, you mentioned criteria that you follow to find these potential gold mine products. Mm -hmm. What criteria are you looking for? So I have a criteria of six. So the first one is it has to have an innate wow factor, either in the product or either in the video. Second thing is it has to solve a problem or add value. If you break down every single product, that's the reason we buy it. Solves a problem or adds value. Third thing is that the profit margin. Is there a potential, like, is there a potential to make at least a good profit margin? And then there's marketability. So how can we use the existing footage on the AliExpress product page or the photos and stuff? Is it high perceived value enough for us to sell it on our on our store? And then this is an optional one, but broad market appeal. The more broader the market, the higher you can scale. And then the last thing is timing, definitely. So you wanna aim for untapped products, fresh products, or old products. Old products. Is yeah. this going back to what you were saying about the fact that you can recycle products? Yeah, so eight months is usually the earliest for an old product. So eight months to a couple of years is, is generally an old product. You mentioned that you like products that appeal to broad audiences, but mm -hmm. when we were talking about those pants, you were talking about how you like it because it's not like you would target one broad audience. You just had so many niche audiences that you mm -hmm. could target that the total audience was broad. Mm -hmm. Would you do the same thing with these lights? Are you thinking of like several niche audiences to target? When I see this product, I see that we have gaming, definitely gaming. We have computers, consoles, certain video games. So that's already multiple niches right there. And then we have potential people who like LEDs, 
So if you just type in LEDs as a Facebook interest, you're gonna see a couple of them. And then you also have home decor, kind of people living in dormitories, students. Mm. Um, so you have to be able to look at a product and see who all could potentially buy this product. If a new dropshipper wants to sell this product and they do want to target those different audiences, mm -hmm. do you recommend they do that all in their first ad campaign? So like one ad set per different audience with the same creative or how do you structure that? So each product gets its own campaign, right? So each campaign has five ad sets minimum, five to eight ad sets, whatever your budget is, at eight to ten dollars a day. And these interests, you want to be diverse, you want to be broad, yet specific. So whenever I choose my interests, I always come up with like 20 interests and then always do process of elimination, see which ones are the most broad, which ones are specifically relevant, and then which ones are diverse. So a lot of my students ask me, what do I mean by diverse? So if you're selling a, a pet product, you do not want to just sell that pet product to dog breeds. Like you want to be selling it to dog breeds, dog magazines, public figures that are related to dogs, um, dog food brands. So that's what I mean by diverse. I see, okay. Mm -hmm. It's really helpful to hear you talk through how you would structure your Facebook ad sets. Mm -hmm. um, and just in generally, I have to say, you have been one of the richest sources of information in a single interview that we've ever done on this show. So this Thank has you. been great. Thank you. But Thank you. before I let you leave, what is one piece of advice you would give new dropshippers in 2020? Understand that this is a numbers game. If you, if you decide to get into dropshipping, you must commit to finding your first winning product because before you ever find your first winning product, you're gonna face a lot of discouragement. You're gonna be putting in a lot of money towards these products and putting in a lot of work as well and to ultimately not be making any money. It's very discouraging. Everybody goes through that and it's, it's very discouraging. So you have to look on the bright side, just focus on that one product that's going to basically recover all of those losses, plus give you like a very handsome amount of profit. Um, so I would just say just continue to persist and don't believe that it's you know too late because it's never too late There's always going to be a limitless supply of winning products and there's really no differentiation between you and the very successful job shippers If you have a winning product and we don't you're going to outpace us essentially So just focus on that and uh, don't be discouraged and where can people follow up with you for more information? Yeah, so you guys can check out my YouTube channel. It's Ecom Paul, and I also do one-on-one -on -one mentorship. So it's at ecomswip.com. You can uh, apply there and uh, we can get in touch. We'll leave links to both of those below. Thank you everyone for tuning in today and thank you, Paul. Yeah, thank you. And until next time, learn often, market better. And sell more. <laughs>